for the second part of this presentation, I'm going to talk about the physiology of acute ischemic stroke. And it's very important to understand the physiology of acute ischemic stroke to understand your perfusion maps. So that's why I included a lot of it. Well, a lot. It's not that much, but just the absolute basics. So this is an example from daily clinical practice. A patient has an occlusion of the main branch of the left middle cerebral artery. And these are the perfusion maps that are generated in this patient. Uh, we can describe what we see on the perfusion maps, but we also need to understand a bit what happens if you get an arterial occlusion to understand what happens on the perfusion maps. So let's try that. What is the absolute basis? Well, the absolute basis of understanding perfusion and understanding vascular pathophysiology and stroke is that the brain needs oxygen. The brain needs oxygen and a lot of it. And uh, also immediately, because the brain does not have a lot of energy uh, spared up, the moment the brain doesn't receive uh, oxygen anymore, cells start to suffer. So the cerebral blood flow needs to be continuous and constant for the brain to function properly. Um, <clears throat> so we need a continuous cerebral blood flow. And this is a very important one. What is cerebral blood flow in the brain? Well, it's determined by the pressure divided by the resistance. Uh, so the cerebral perfusion pressure rather divided by the resistance and cerebral perfusion pressure is calculated as the mean arterial pressure minus the intracranial pressure. That's not so important for this presentation. What you have to remember is that flow equals pressure divided by resistance. That's a very important one. So what happens if you have an arterial occlusion? Let's first uh, talk what happens on a general vascular level. So this is a skull. Here we have uh, the internal carotid artery and the right middle cerebral artery supplying the territory of the middle cerebral artery. Now imagine a patient does a proximal uh, occlusion of the no let's imagine a patient does an occlusion of the main branch of the middle cerebral artery what will happen well the territory of the middle cerebral artery gets less blood self-evidently the perfusion pressure will decrease and because the perfusion pressure decreases flow decreases so we have less blood flow through this area because flow is pressure divided by resistance pressure decreases, so flow decreases. But the brain needs oxygen, and the brain will do everything to maintain cerebral blood flow. Well, first of all, we have an occlusion here, so flow can no longer get there through the middle cerebral artery. So the first thing the brain will do is it will recruit collaterals. There are other vascular systems in the brain that still receive blood, for instance, the area of the uh, right uh, anterior cerebral artery is not occluded, blood still flows there, and in a normal brain there are collaterals, there are connections between small branches uh, of the uh, cerebral artery territory and the middle cerebral artery territory. These are normally closed, but in cases where the perfusion pressure decreases, these will open up, and as a consequence, blood can now flow from the area of the uh, anterior cerebral artery to that of the middle cerebral artery. So hooray, blood has once again reached the area of the middle cerebral artery, but it will take a lot more time to get there because it takes a detour. So our uh, time uh, parameters like the mean transit time, uh, the T max and so on, they, those will increase. This makes sense if you look at it this way, that those will increase. Blood needs more time to get there. And of course, the, the pressure will also be lower when it gets there because it takes a lot more time and pressure will decrease the more time it needs. Makes sense. Then there's a second mechanism that comes into play, that's cerebral autoregulation. So flow is perfusion divided by resistance. So what can we also do, or what can the brain also do when pressure decreases? Uh, it can decrease resistance. If pressure decreases, but resistance decreases too, flow will increase once again. 
and it does that by arterial dilatation. By dilatation of the arteries, the resistance will decrease and flow will increase. So we have a lower resistance, flow will increase, but because the caliber of the uh, arteries and the vessels has now increased, uh, blood also needs more time to go through them, so we have an increased mean transit time. But this also means that there is more time for the brain parenchyma to extract oxygen because blood stays longer in the microvascular bed, so the brain has more time to extract oxygen from the blood. I hope this makes sense or this is clear to you. So let's illustrate the same concept in a different way. So what happens in the brain when we get an acute arterial occlusion? Flow as pressure divided by resistance. The brain will do anything to preserve the blood flow and it will recruit collaterals and we will have arterial dilatation. Oh yeah, also keep in mind you have a lot of collateral systems in the brain. So there's more than connections between the anterior cerebral artery system and the millicerebral artery system. There are a lot of collateral systems systems, but discussing those is not the point of this presentation. So the first thing that happens if we have an arterial occlusion is the cerebral perfusion pressure falls, the brain, so the pressure drops, uh, the brain will try to lower the resistance to maintain the blood flow. We have recruitment of collateral, so blood can still reach uh, the territory of the millicerebral artery, but needs more time, and we have arterial dilatation to decrease resistance. This will uh, cause cerebral blood flow to be temporarily maintained, and blood has more time to be extracted, or oxygen, uh, there's more time for oxygen extraction. Uh, now, the same concept translated to perfusion maps. What happens if the cerebral perfusion pressure falls? Well, time will always be prolonged because we have arterial dilatation, so the arteries increase in caliber, so uh, blood will need more time to go through them will move slower through them and we also have a group of collateral so blood the blood needs to take a longer uh, route to reach a microvascular bed so time is always prolonged in the case of an acute arterial occlusion so all our time parameters like the mean transit time the time to peak the time to drain the tmax the, those will all increase because cerebral blood vessels dilate, the cerebral blood volume will initially increase. So the brain will try to compensate by increasing or at least maintaining the cerebral blood volume. So the cerebral blood volume map is also a very important one. And then we have the cerebral blood flow map, which is a measure of uh, whether or not there is sufficient blood supply to the brain. So the flow, the flow will initially be maintained, but this mechanism will only function for a limited amount of time. So because the time is prolonged, there is more time for oxygen extraction. So this is the first mechanism, cerebral autoregulation. But as said, it can only function or maintain that for a short amount of time before the system starts to collapse and cerebral blood flow will start to decrease eventually. Um, this is very interesting. So as said, initially cerebral blood flow will be maintained, but then it will drop. And we have various stages in cerebral blood flow drop. And I'm now going to reference or uh, to some experiments that took place on monkeys, I believe in the 70s or the 80s, and that have identified specific points, uh, the cellular repercussions rather, of a drop in cerebral blood flow. And there are two points that are very important. Well, first of all, what is the normal CBF? What is a normal measure for cerebral blood flow? Well, the normal cerebral blood flow for the gray matter is somewhere between 60 and 100 milliliters per 100 grams of brain tissue per minute. That's normal. So if you have a cerebral blood flow that is lower than 60 milliliters per 100 gram per minute, we are dealing with a hypo perfusion, a decreased perfusion, which is very general. Uh, a very important point in uh, the blood flow is when blood flow drops between 22 milliliters per 100 grams per minute, because on a cellular level, then we get electrical failure, failure and cellular dysfunction. This is the point that cells can no longer, can no longer function properly. They become stunned and we will get 
symptoms, clinical symptoms, but the function, these cells can still recover. They, uh, they are not yet irreversibly lost to us. So the point between 60 milliliters and 22 milliliters per 100 grams per minute is called the benign oligemia. Patients are asymptomatic, so the blood flow is decreased, but cells can still function properly. And when we reach the point that patients develop clinical uh, symptoms, we have what is called uh, reached the point of ischemia. So cells no longer function properly, they are stunned, and patients become symptomatic and have focal neurological deficits. There's a second a very important point in time, and that's when the cerebral blood flow drops be be, uh, below 10 milliliters per 100 gram uh, of brain tissue per minute, because then the cell membrane integrity starts to get lost and uh, cells will start to die. So this is the point that the cells can no longer be recovered and start to undergo necrosis. So it's a very important time. Uh, the point where cells no longer function properly but can still be recovered is called the penumbra so it's between 22 and 10 milliliters per 100 gram per minute and the point where cells are irreversibly lost is called the infarct core uh, and it's below 10 milliliters per 100 gram per minute and Time also plays an important role. So um, the time as a brain concept is basically a pretty old one. Uh, I believe introduced in 1981, also based on um, monkey studies. And the authors of uh, this specific study here uh, measured, uh, looked at the symptoms, I looked at what happened on a cellular level if an uh, acute arterial occlusion was generated and well of course monkeys developed a paralysis so focal neurological deficits uh, below a threshold of 22 milliliters per 100 gram per minute but the longer you wait the more infarction you will see so eventually if you just have the penumbra long enough the penumbra will evolve into an infarction so it's not that you can function um, so you can keep functioning uh, without having cell loss uh, in the penumbra system penumbra will eventually evolve into an infarct core if you just wait long enough so that's also a very important concept for stroke treatment as you all know so two important uh, time points cbf drops below 22 milliliters per 100 gram per minute we go into the penumbra stage, we develop focal neurological deficits. Below 10 milliliters, we will go undergo infarction and infarction will increase, uh, the size of the infarction will increase the longer we wait and after about three to four and a half hours will reach its maximum. Uh, so let's illustrate the various stages of what happens in an acute arterial uh, ischemic stroke over here. And uh, let's look at cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, and the mean transit time. So the, paramet uh, the parameters we use for analyzing perfusion maps. So in the normal system, cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, and mean transit time are maintained. If you get an acute arterial occlusion, or you have, if you have a high-grade stenosis, the brain, well, mean transit time will increase, uh, and the brain will try to maintain the cerebral blood flow by arterial dilatation, and the cerebral blood volume will increase slightly, but just enough to maintain the cerebral blood volume. Now, the next stage will be benign oligemia. Uh, what happens then? In benign oligemia, cerebral blood volume is still slightly increased and this is man maintained but cerebral blood flow will start to drop a little we don't not enough to have clinical symptoms so we're still way up uh, above the threshold of 22 milliliters per 100 gram of brain tissue per minute but it starts to drop a little and the mean transit time will increase even further and then we go to the penumbra stage. Now, cerebral blood volume cannot keep up. It starts to decrease a little, not very much, because if you look at the reference value, we're still uh, approximately in the neighborhood of normal values, but it just cannot keep going up. Uh, the system starts to fail a little bit. As a consequence, cerebral blood flow will start to drop. 
more uh, pronounced, we'll have a more pronounced drop in cerebral blood flow and mean transit time increases even further. And in the core, while well, everything starts to collapse, cerebral blood flow, cerebral blood volume, they decrease even further and the mean transit time increases even more. So let's look at the various perfusion maps. What happens with mean transit time? Well, the mean transit time is basically always increased. It's increased in benign oligemia, it's increased in the penumbra, it's increased in the core. What happens at the level of the cerebral blood flow and the cerebral blood volume? Well, these are both approximately maintained in a system of benign oligemia. Slightly increased cerebral blood volume, slightly decreased cerebral blood flow, flow, but they are not too far off the baseline, the normal baseline. Then in the penumbra, we see a more pronounced decrease in the cerebral blood flow and cells no longer function properly, we develop symptoms, but the cerebral blood volume is about maintained. It's still pretty normal. And this is basically the mechanism that's still in play to try to keep the cerebral blood flow going. But in core, the entire system collapses, cerebral blood flow decreases even more, and we have also a decrease in cerebral blood volume. And this here is basically the basis for an eyeball interpretation of your perfusion maps, which is something you should always do. So this brings us to the next part, how to interpret your perfusion CT images. 